around the turn of the 20th century, there was a little known gold rush in Southwest Oklahoma. Americans came from all over to seek their fortunes in gold, silver, and copper. Most were disappointed. And in 1903, the United States government determined there wasn't enough gold in the Wichita mountains to make mining cost-effective. But the lure of quick riches remains to the present day. Panners and prospectors are joined by treasure hunters, chasing legends of Spanish gold and buried outlaw treasure. Next, we look back in time for the lost gold of Oklahoma. Early in the morning near Mears, a group of Oklahoma prospectors are sifting the sand and looking for something shiny. Let's get some of this gold down here. We gotta go down to this bedrock area right over here. And uh, Mike was saying that the way that water turns up underneath it and stops at that bedrock should be primed area. So let's hit it, you guys, let's hit it. On any given weekend, they pack up the gear and the kids and they spend the day in a dry stream bed looking for gold. Gold fever is a sickness of which there is no cure. We, uh, we, we get out there as much as we possibly can and, and we bring material home with us and we go through that material just, just so we stop shaking. <laughs> they look for black sand deposits in streams where the water may have pushed a small nugget or two into a crack. There's not much to be found in Oklahoma, but that doesn't stop them from looking. That little bottle there is right now, I think, $1,600. And uh, it ain't the money to us, it's the fun, the good time we have, meeting a lot of nice people, finding it. And we have a ball. And uh, we really enjoy getting out and doing it. It's the first kiss. <laughs> I tell you what, when you get that first, what they call the first flash in the pan, and you did that yourself. This is, this is a piece of gold that nobody in history has ever seen before. <laughs> the lure of lost treasure has brought many men to Oklahoma who spent their lives looking for the X on a secret map. They say there's more gold buried in uh, the wildlife refuge per square mile than anywhere else in the United States. That even includes California. There's a number of areas where a lot of gold is hidden. The legends of lost gold go back 400 years in Oklahoma as Spanish explorer Francisco Vesquez de Coronado crossed the plains in search of the seven cities of gold. The Spanish were good about chasing legends. Uh, they were in here. Uh, probably from the 1700s through the early 1800s, uh, Mexicans as well. Uh, Devil's Canyon uh, over by Altus, that's a, uh, one of their uh, campsites, I guess. Well, a lot of the mythology of buried treasure has some foundations in history, as many of our myths have. The Spanish claimed Oklahoma as part of the Spanish Empire as early as the 16th and 17th century. Coronado comes through in 1541 and claims all of this land. Well, the Spanish, of course, are here for gold and silver. Now, there was a legend uh, I read over the years of the Spanish, whenever they took over the Mayans and Aztecs and stuff, they confiscated a lot of gold, and that gold was brought up and buried some in the Wichita Mountains, some near Devil's Canyon, uh, throughout Texas. They, uh, they were said to have buried it all over the place so that they could come back and get it. The, the mythology of gold and silver would follow Coronado. So Coronado's buried gold has, has been one of our mythological stories all this time. But then the Spanish really did come to mine. They've left their mark. Uh, we find Spanish markers quite a bit. Anything from hearts to uh, carvings in the rocks to uh, you know rocks shaped like hearts or birds. 
There's some indication there may have been a Spanish or later Mexican mining camp in the western Wichita mountains. But what the Spanish found in the 17th and 18th centuries is that it was not in enough quantity to, to bear the expense of extracting, smelting, processing, and transporting. There's just not enough there. You'd have to tear down an entire mountain to get an ounce of gold in some cases. Indians used to tell of hearing thunder in the mountains, which was thought to be the Spaniards blowing up stuff to try to mine for gold. There's a few mines around. They were really good about uh, covering their trail. They would backfill the mine shafts, but there are a few that uh, you can still find. Usually they're vertical shafts. Uh, not very big around, you know, they may only be about this big around. One treasure tale has the Spanish hiding Aztec treasure inside a cave in the Wichita's and sealing the entrance with an iron door. And in 1905, I believe it was, there was a um, father and I don't know if it was a daughter or son was cutting through there. And they found that um, the youngster went underneath. It was just barely big enough. And with a torch, looked around and there was gold all over. A lot of gold coins and kegs had uh, gold ingots, bags of gold, little everything, you name it, they had it there. It's all Spanish. The last time that I heard anything about it was this young guy from the Job Corps said he had went behind this big boulder that had slipped off and he said it was behind that boulder. And that would be north of the Job Corps out there. Some say it was Jesse James Iron Door. Some say it was just a Spanish mine that, that they made a door for. Uh, uh, the hundred years that people have been searching for it, it's never been found. Uh, good chance that it was just all it is is a legend. The Spanish that mined in and around the Wichita's left behind several open shafts and symbols carved into the rock. At arostras like this one at the base of Mount Sheridan, donkeys would pull a stone wheel to crush large ore-bearing rocks into siftable dust. Okay, welcome everybody. Near Choctaw, modern prospectors from all over the Midwest meet to swap stories, treasure tips, and to plan new adventures. There's not a whole lot in Oklahoma to go find any gold. We've picked up a few little flakes, you know, on the Arkansas River up there in places. But, you know, we go up there a bunch of us, 15, 20, and we'll have a good time, find a little bit. Well, back in the uh, south, the what, southwest part, I guess, is better than rest. The real fun is out in the dry riverbeds, where whole families spend a weekend turning over rocks and digging out buckets of dirt, hoping to see something shine in their shovel. The gold in this area, we found it to be 18 to 20 karat gold, and uh, some lower grade gold, and, and then up in the higher areas, probably around Medicine Creek, is uh, probably higher grade gold. In 1860, the Wichita Mountains were virtually untouched by the prospector's pick. Overnight, Indian Territory mining camps sprung up with names like Wild Man, Golden Pass, Poverty Gulch, and Oriana. The Army had a hard time keeping prospectors out, but they kept kicking them out because the Kiowas and Comanches still had their reservation. They kept coming back. Probably the next biggest uh, gold rush was 1892 and 1895 in Washita County up by Canute. They uh, found a lot of uh, uh, probably placer gold. Uh, big run on, on that area. Couldn't buy a shovel. From 1901 to about 1907, you have over 2,000 mining claims filed for gold, silver, and copper in the Wichita Mountains. 2,000 miners say, I want to stake this claim, I'm going to mine here. 2,000 filed. There were at least 100 to 150 tunnels and holes, various sorts, and maybe even far more than that, Doug, 
Uh, there were eight or nine smelters or processing plants of various sizes. The largest one called the Gold Bells Mine and uh, had a cyanide smelting plant that was quite large uh, near north of present day Snyder, Oklahoma. They popped up around the Wichita Mountains and towns like Hollis and Snyder would grow because the jobs, the materials coming in came through those railroad depots. By the 1890s, early 1900s, there were comparisons of the Wichita Mountains to Cripple Creek in Colorado or Klondike. There's going to be another Klondike here that, that those terms show up in, nationally in newspapers. The Lawton Constitution had articles that, that hyped it and said, yes, it could be. And of course, uh, it was wishful thinking, but it was also a way of, of gaining attention and, and making money. And you had people who uh, would scatter throughout every crevice in the area along uh, Mount Sheridan to the north and try to find uh, uh, gold and silver. Uh, but most of these were not as large or as, as long-lived as the as places like Deadwood and so forth. So very minuscule in comparison to, because now if gold had been discovered, then you would have had real, a real mining camps. You guys uh, come back in and uh, hard drinking and rabble rousing. Just anything to take up time like that, just to have fun, just to break the monotony. You get these young people, rough frontier, everyone carrying weapons, working with their hands, you get a rough crowd. That leads to prostitution, to illegal alcohol, to gambling, to fights, to murders. In 1903, the U.S. Geological Survey sent out a geologist to determine once and for all how much gold was in them, their hills. He found traces of gold and silver in one of those. And he said it's not anywhere near being uh, economically feasible. And there was some copper and some lead and things of that nature, but not near the quantities that would make it commercial. And uh, so that kind of deflated people in 1904, but that didn't stop people from believing that there were all kinds of veins of ore coursing through the, the Wichita Mountains. A lot of promoters would salt the, uh, the mine that they had and bring in as many people as they could to buy stocks. Well come to find out those were salted. Uh, usually a bunch of uh, nuggets were fired into the rocks using a shotgun. And they think they hit it big. Nothing in paying quantities was ever found. People selling dynamite and shovels or uh, shares in the claims. That's who made the money. Some men are not content to sift and dig. Since before statehood, treasure hunters have followed clue after clue and some found what they were looking for. As a treasure hunter, you're a, you're a historian, you know, part explorer, part investigator. I mean, it's just, it, ta it takes it, all of it and, you know, combine it into one to be successful. It's solving problems that no one else has solved. You know, it's the thrill of the chase. It's more like looking for something instead of finding it. It's like finding your first silver quarter when you're metal detecting, you know. It, it only gets better the, the bigger the find. But I've found uh, Spanish artifacts. Uh, that's always neat to know that you're at a site that someone was there, you know, 250, 300 years ago before you. And that they left a little piece for you to find. In 1932, Joe Hunter was a peace officer in Rush Springs when a mysterious silver-haired man named Cook unfolded a story of hidden riches and gave him three maps. I guess you could say he is obsessed with the treasure. From the time that he first received his maps to the, the moment that he died, that's what consumed his life. I mean, as soon as he got enough money to, to hit the road and, and look for it, that's what he, he did. He abandoned job and family alike just to, uh, to go find that next clue. But it, he probably went as far as anyone on chasing down the Frank and Jesse's treasure. Now, perhaps the single most famous story about treasure in Oklahoma is that uh, story about Jesse James and the Keechee Hills, uh, which are near present-day cement and south of Anadarko near cement and Fletcher in that area. Back in the 
1800s, the story goes that somewhere near El Paso or something that the that the James gang robbed a packload uh, train of mules, uh, Mexicans that were carrying gold. They then brought that gold on the mules up to the Wichita Mountains. When they were coming uh, coming up here with that 18 burrow loads, they got caught in a blizzard. And traveling was so hard, what they did was they dumped it into the little canyon there and then covered it up best they could and then burned the pack saddles. But they came back for it. And from there, from there, then they divided it up into the different caches. That's whenever they carved up the copper kettle contract, uh, stating how much there was and how they would divide it and everything when they returned for it. The treasure hunters believe Jesse James himself carved a secret pact into this brass bucket and buried it in the Kichai Hills near cement. It just says 5th day of March 1876 that these people put together a bounty bank and that they were burying this and uh, basically it was each person's name was carved in it saying that they they got an equal portion of it. Um, story goes that they made up the contract because some of the people um, questioned whether or not there'd be any type of guarantee. They, uh, there were some trust issues. I'm sure there was. I mean, they were all robbers. I can see how you wouldn't trust them. When the thieves went back to get their gold, they started at a natural landmark. Buzzard Roost, this is kind of like the epicenter of hiding treasure in Oklahoma. Uh, the brass bucket contract, the I left Kansas map, the, the copper map, uh, just this was the area that they would come to. Faint carvings into the weathered rock are believed to be Jesse James' coded guide to the location of the bloodstained treasure. Right up here we have the, the pistol and knife that are carved kind of faint, we might be able to outline it for you. Knife is here, pistol there. Normally, if a pistol or a knife, they're pointing at the next clue or the object buried, and normally it's not far away, because, you know, pistol is a short range weapon. So, depending on whether the hammer's cocked or not cocked, it's just different factors. Yeah, we're basically standing right above where the cave would have been. Uh, if you look down from here, you can kind of see down into where it was, but the rocks have fell in over time. This is where the brass bucket that Joe Hunter found. This is the, the outlaw contract that was carved in it. So this fifth day of March, 1876, in the year of our Lord, 1876, we the undersigned do this day organize a bounty bank. We will go to the west side of the Kichai Hills, which is about 50 yards from the cross rifles which they used to set up here on the hill. It says, follow the trail line coming through the mountains just east of a lone hill, which the lone hill is, is buzzard's roost here, where we buried Jack. Jack was actually laid out in rocks right over here. Um, Hunter found this, oh, probably in the, the 30s or 40s is when he noticed that Jack was laid out in rocks and it correlated to the, uh, the brass bucket pack. The photo we have that, that Hunter had taken, you know, clearly shows it right over here. Jack, they believe, is code for gold. In a small cave on Buzzard's Roost, Joe Hunter dug up an iron tea kettle. Inside were more clues. This is the tea kettle with the, with the stuff that was found in the tea kettle. You got the watch, there are several coins, a star, the legend says Frank and Jesse planned on using the outlaw gold to buy a ranch that stretched from the Wichita's to the Red River, and that after Jesse's death, Frank bought a house in Fletcher and spent the rest of his days searching for the loot. They said he spent a lot of time between Fletcher and Missouri. So he would come down here and spend some time. I know different places he hunted for treasure. One place was over here by Marlowe. They'd see him go out there, but never where he went. He was pretty uh, crafty when it came down to it. And uh, 
a lot of loot is still theirs. He's real good friends with the banker in Fletcher. Uh, and at one time he brought in a, a big roll of moldy uh, bills to deposit in an account. So they've been freshly dug. Evidently, Frank and Jesse spent a lot of time in Oklahoma, which the historians don't attribute any of that time to them spent here in Oklahoma, but nevertheless, they did. A lot of people claims that, they're, that they were never here, uh, claims that the gentleman in Fletcher was actually a gentleman named Sam Collins uh, that was paid to take the fall for uh, Frank James. However, at Anadarko, uh, the courthouse, there's actually a copy of his, Frank James's will filed there. Uh, whenever he died in Missouri, they had to file a copy there since he owned land in that county, stating his belongings and stuff. Other outlaws used the rugged Oklahoma landscape to shake the law and perhaps to store their stolen riches. Did Bell Star bury gold? Who knows? She may have. Did she steal gold? Probably. And we can prove that maybe she, she stole it. Uh, can we prove that Frank James was in Oklahoma? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but we do know that the Doolin and Dalton gang rode in Oklahoma. We do know that Bonnie and Clyde and Pretty Boy Floyd were in Oklahoma. Uh, did they bring any of their loot and bury it? Maybe. Not all the treasure in the Wichita's is gold and silver. A Kiowa legend says an Indian paradise lies beneath Mount Scott. I guess this buffalo, it's a semi-mystical story, but I believed it all my life. When they were going to leave us for good, the grandpa buffalo was walking. It's better told in Kiowa, but he's walking along and he sees this stack of bones. He goes a little bit further and he recognizes his grandmother's bones. Then he goes a little further and the bones are getting higher and higher. It just stacks. And some of their, you know, they were just left there because people were just taking their coats off. That's how it was told to me. And he got real sad because he said, my whole family is out here. I'm alone now. What good are we doing? mankind anymore if they're just going to come and kill my people. So he takes this little herd and it's on a misty fall morning. And they say the mountain opened up and in there it looked like an Indian paradise with the campground and all of that. And they walked in there and it closed up and this young Kiowa lady seen that happen. And that's how, you know, the buffalo's not here anymore, and we, we only have that past life and dreams or stories now. It's gone. And it still makes somebody from my era sad, you know, that our folks had to live through this transition. And the people that were my elders were such great people. We can't begin to emulate them. We can try. That's the least we can do. After a morning of digging, a pile of dirt and sand is reduced down to just a few grains in the bottom of the pan. Now the black that you see in here is actually an iron uh, type of a, a substance called magnetite. And if you pick that up with a magnet, you know, it'll actually lift with a magnet because it's a type of an iron. So we look for the iron when we're prospecting because it's so heavy that if there's gold in the area, that heavy gold is gonna fall out in the same place that the black iron falls out. That might be a piece of gold right there. The search for gold can be a fever. For Oklahoma treasure hunters, it's a lifelong passion and they found more than gold along the way. Actually, uh, the thrill is in the hunt. You know, once you find it, it's found. There's no more hunt. You have to go to the next one. So for me, it's, it's the hunt itself. It's not so much the finding of it. 
Uh, when you find something, it just verifies that you're on the right track. That optimism is typical of Oklahoma. And then when you take the little kernel of truth in history, magnify it with the, the mists of time, people want to believe that. And so lost treasures are a part of life in Oklahoma and always will be. As long as you're, you're looking, it's interesting because it's research. And uh, you're finding out things, you're learning things. That's what keeps us going. And I've learned more about history from having to research you know, this than probably a lot of people will ever know. I mean, Oklahoma is just loaded with history. Treasure hunting and gold panning are strictly prohibited in the Wichita Mountains National Wildlife Refuge. Violators may be charged with a variety of federal crimes and face fines and restitution costs. The price of prospecting may be still higher on Fort Sills gunnery ranges where things routinely explode. And of course, permission should be obtained from private property owners before searching for the lost gold of Oklahoma. For a copy of this program, please send a check or money order for $22.95 to the OETA Foundation, Post Office Box 14190, Oklahoma City 73113, or call 800-879-6382.